All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to another Copernic uh, virtual program this evening. Uh, we have a, a great program for you on the Soviet Lunar Exploration Program tonight, uh, presented by David Woods, uh, returning presenter. And uh, we'll get started with that very shortly. Uh, I do have some uh, announcements to make about regarding future live streams like this and uh, some potential even future in-person programs uh, coming up. So uh, let's go through those, switching over to a presenter view. There we go. Uh, so, so I can see it there. Uh, this is our website, if you are unfamiliar at all, uh, copernic.org. Uh, uh, and you can uh, look at all of our future upcoming presentations here, um, like tonight's uh, on the Soviet Lunar Program. Uh, we also have on April 8th a blood drive here uh, at uh, our, our facility. It's going to be a blood drive in this room that I'm in right now in space science. So um, if you are interested in donating blood, please come visit us on that day. There's a bunch of details there. Uh, you can explore more. You register at uh, www.redcrossblood.org. Um, but please visit the website for more information on that. We also have uh, another uh, live stream program like this one on April 9th uh, about alternative energy presented by Dr. Gay Canal, I think you pronounce it. Um, he's the founder and president of ETM SolarWorks. So uh, some renewable energy discussions there. Uh, be on the lookout for that. Of course, we are always trying to do our observing live streams. We had a really nice one uh, last Saturday. Um, we got to view galaxies and star clusters and the moon. It was a really great night, um, super clear. Uh, we had that string of great nights, um, so we were really lucky to have those. Uh, right now we're heading towards full moon. Uh, if, I think in the next couple days even it might be the full moon. So uh, not much in the way of, of observing deep sky, but if we get some clear skies, maybe we will try something there. Uh, Race to the Stars comes up on April 24th, uh, so uh, if any of you are runners, uh, register for this 5K road race. It's right along uh, Underwood Road, um, and it's our third annual one. We're, we're keeping, up, uh, keeping up with these, so uh, please join us for that event as well. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention was the um, summer camps this year, if uh, any students uh, or any, any of your kids have attended our summer camps. Um, we are going to do them again, and most likely they will be a sort of split. In what some are going to be virtual programs like last year, um, so virtual camps, and that's especially good if, if you live um, if non-locally, if you live in another state. I know we had a few from Virginia uh, joining our camps uh, last year. Um, but if, if that appeals to you, you know, we're going to, we're going to be holding virtual camps. Um, but we are also currently planning to hold in-person camps as well. Uh, so, uh, we'll have registrations for those coming up soon. Um, but just as a little, little, uh, tease of what's to come. Lastly, I always like to do this. I always like to check our clear sky chart just to see for any potential opportunities coming up for an observing stream. Looks like right now Monday maybe <laughs> um, that, at least that's what it's showing me right now um, but we will we will see we usually try to keep our, our streams around the weekend time frame just because those are late night streams I know the last one went on for six hours and I was here until 3 a.m. <laughs> so uh, we we will do our uh, best to, to hit the weekends but you know we do a midweek stream here and there all right so uh, I think what I will do is I will switch back to my camera view. There we go. And I will introduce uh, David Woods uh, for uh, the program. Let me make sure the PowerPoint's on here. There we go. And that should click through. Okay. All right. So here is David Woods. Very good. Thank you. Now, this is what they're seeing here, right? Uh, not quite yet. If you, wanted, okay. if you wanted to say anything on camera, go right okay. ahead. Well, thank you very much. As I say, I'll be doing tonight's presentation, one of many. We have a number of uh, very interesting people in the community who come in and volunteer to do different presentations. 
My hot button is uh, space programs, especially the Russian and Soviet programs. And my uh, uh, preference is what does it look like and how does it work? And that's what most of tonight's presentation is going to be. So having said that, I'd like to get into the presentation itself. If we can switch over. That's the wrong one, PowerPoint, there we go. And here we go. So tonight's presentation is the uh, Soviet Lunar Exploration Program. Uh, let's see, page down. I think we have to click on the window for Windows. There we go. Nope. So <laughs> it worked. It always works before the stream and never during the stream. Exactly. There we go. There we I go. Should be able to. Oh, you know, I think you might have to use the arrow keys. Up and down here. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, 2019 was the 50th anniversary of Americans landing uh, astronauts on the moon. At the time, we appeared to be in competition with the Soviet Union uh, as to who was going to be first to get there. As time went on and no Soviet cosmonauts conducted similar missions, it was generally concluded that there was no similar Soviet program because they went on to start conducting Earth orbital space station missions instead that had nothing to do with the moon. At the end of the Soviet Union in 1998, and with the new policies of Glasnost, which meant listen, and Perestroika, which meant openness, we began to learn that it, there was a multifaceted program with many elements of it that survive today. Most of that information uh, has come out from former workers involved in those programs who were then free to document, publish, speak broad, abroad, and uh, about the details of the programs. So before we get into the program, I'd like to give you a little bit of uh, background. In 1945, the Soviet Union had come through World War II after suffering some horrendous losses. These included deaths of 26.6 million of its people. Uh, and by comparison, the United States had suffered only half a million casualties, bad as it was, but nothing like what they had. Their leaders were able to beat back the Nazis on the Eastern Front with massive numbers of troops, tanks, and artillery, but they had nothing comparable to Allied air power, much less missiles that could reach across continents and oceans. So during the war, the Soviets and the Allies had seen the destructive power of the Nazi V-2 ballistic missiles, and each knew that the technology that went into them would be important assets to recover and exploit. At the end of World War II, the U.S. Army pushed into what would eventually become East Germany that would come under Soviet control. They came upon a vast underground facility at Metalwork where V-2 rockets were being assembled by slave labor. In just 10 days, they were all able to load up 341 rail cars with enough missile parts, machinery equipment to build 100 V-2 rockets and transport them to Antwerp ahead of the Soviets. There they loaded them onto 16 Liberty ships and shipped them to New Orleans and eventually White Sands, New Mexico. They didn't take everything, so there was quite a bit of uh, missile parts and equipment left behind for the Soviets to recover, enough for them to assemble 30 V-2s before shipping them back to the Soviet Union. Werner von Braun and about 100 key V-2 personnel surrendered to the Americans. They came to the United States and went to work for the U.S. Army at facilities in Huntsville, Alabama and White Sands, New Mexico, to continue work on the V-2 and eventually other follow-on missile programs. The Soviets were able to capture some V-2 components and some technicians, but nothing like what the Americans were able to collect. As time went on, when the first satellites were launched, some would contend that their German scientists had beat our German scientists in the space race. That actually was not the case. The Soviets had some very talented engineers and design bureaus working on missiles and rocket engine development starting well back in the 1930s. Among the most famous of their engineers were Sergei Kurilov, who was head of the uh, uh, lead Soviet uh, rocket engineer and spacecraft designer at the OKB-1. OKB is Russian for Experimental Design Bureau. And he is regarded by many as the father of practical astronautics. Valentin Gleshko, uh, his design bureau, built a lot of the liquid propellant rocket engines. Valentin Glushko, uh, Valentin uh, Chalamet, Vladimir Chalamet, uh, his design bureau 
was mainly into military systems like cruise missiles and very large ICBMs and uh, also military space stations. And then finally, Mikhail Yangel uh, d concentrated on uh, some uh, missiles and launch vehicles as well. Uh, Yangel's Yuznoi Design Bureau in the Ukraine played no major role in the lunar program other than to design and build the lunar lander propulsion system. Instead, he produced numerous uh, missiles, including the SS-4 and 5 SS, standing for surface to surface, that were installed in Cuba in 1962. Those two were converted into two-stage launch vehicles for the small Cosmo satellite series. And these satellites were scientific research as well as military intelligence and surveillance missions. And there you can see a couple of the uh, small Cosmo satellites in the upper right-hand corner. So the Soviets gained possession of some V-2 manufacturing facilities after the war and moved it all to the Soviet Union where they reestablished V-2 production. They set up a base at the desert near Kapustin Yar in the Volga River where they could uh, begin testing and flying V-2 rockets in their own version called the R-1. They would go on to develop bigger and more powerful missiles on their own called the R-1, the R-2, R-3, and so on. But eventually they decided to build a new test uh, center further inland at a tiny stop on the moscow Tashkent rail line for much larger intercontinental range missiles. CIA radio interceptions of launches determined the approximate location of that center. Recovered Nazi maps of the area from their invasion during World War II showed that the rail stop was named Tira Tam. So the CIA called the center the Tira Tam Missile Test Center. A Soviet city was built south of the rail stop on the Sirdaya River that they called Leninsk. And you can see where Tira Tam is in the uh, color map there and uh, what the uh, complex of uh, roads and so on, the, the airport look like. The little uh, map in the uh, lower left corner is a blow up of the original Wehrmacht map. And it says Tier Tam Bonhoff. Bonhoff is Russian for railroad station. So in 1963, Korolev's OKB-1 Design Bureau was given the task to develop an ICBM that could deliver a five metric ton nuclear warhead over an intercontinental range of up to 8,800 kilometers, which is about 5,500 miles. That became the 8K-71 R7 Simyorka, which is Russian for seven. Because the uh, missile had to be rail transported to its launch sites at uh, Tiratam, under bridges and so on, it was developed in modular form four strap-on side boosters attached to a center core. Glushko's design bureau had problems with combustion stability in large engines, so he developed engines with clusters of thrust chambers for the R7. The strap-on boosters used the RD-107 engine with a single pump, four fixed chambers, and two gimbaled vernier steering engines. The center core stage used the RD-108 engine with a single pump, four fixed chambers, and four gimbaled steering engines. All of them used liquid oxygen and kerosene as propellant. Over 1,600 variants of the R-7 have been launched to date. So it, uh, they got a lot of mileage out of it. Launch attempts began in 1957. The first one failed when fire broke out in one of the strap-ons that you can see below there. Uh, as it broke away, causing the missile to crash at 248 miles uh, downrange. The second launch occurred in July, but it failed when it disintegrated about to half a minute uh, after launch, crashing just a few miles downrange. A third launch attempt it came in August, and it traveled full range, as, as did another test in September 1957 each with a mock-up warhead that disintegrated on schedule uh, and in re-entry over the Kamchatka Peninsula. Korolev had always uh, been more interested in using the R-7 for space missions, so he was able to get approval to use the next test launch to place a satellite in, in orbit. The PS-1 
which is Russian for simplified satellite, was a uh, two feet diameter polished metal sphere. It was a sphere so that uh, the drag would be even on it. It would be constant so they could measure the upper atmosphere density. It uh, was battery powered and would use transmit and would transmit secret signals on two frequencies that uh, could be easily detected by radio amateurs. Propagation of its radio signals would give them data about the upper ionosphere. The launch came on October 4th, 1957, placing Sputnik 1 into a 134 by 583 mile, 65 degree inclination orbit that took it over most of the world's populated areas. Its batteries lasted 21 days and it burned up on re-entry January 4th, 1958. The Russians announced the launch with a tiny article on the inside page of the Russian newspaper Pravda, placing little initial significance to it. The Western press went ballistic over the launch. So the Soviet newspaper followed the, on the following day realized the propaganda value and made, began to give it full coverage. The re reaction in the West was anger and panic giving rise to what would become the space race where each try, side tried to uh, outdo the other with more spectacular launches. Khrushchev was delighted with the reaction to Sputnik 1 so he tasked Korolev with more spectaculars. Sputnik 2 was launched a month later with a uh, half ton, uh, well, 1120 pound payload that remained attached to the orbiting core stage. Housed in a special container was a dog, Laika, that was not intended to be recovered. Only years later did the Soviets uh, admit that the mission had failed and Laika had died of extreme heat, probably because the aerodynamic nose cap had failed to separate. Lyco's vital signs were normal for the first three orbits, but on the fourth orbit, the cabin temperature rose to 109 degrees Fahrenheit. Data received on the second day showed no signs of breathing, heartbeat, or blood pressure. By November 6, there was no signs of life in the capsule, and on November 10, the batteries ran out and all data transmission ceased. Sputnik 2 re-entered the atmosphere in April. 1958 after 162 days in orbit. The Soviets then tried to launch a heavy research satellite called Object D in April 1958. It failed and crashed 129 miles downrange. A backup spacecraft was successfully launched in May 1958 and it became Sputnik 3. And if you take a look at the pictures, you've got Sputnik 3 weighing 2,926 pounds. Explorer 1, which is the first American satellite, weighed 30.8 pounds. And tiny little Vanguard 1 weighed 3.2 pounds. The United States was eventually, uh, was finally able to launch uh, satellites of its own. Uh, Vanguard, or Explorer 1, February 1958, and the grapefruit-sized Vanguard 1 on March 1958 and Vanguard 1 is still in orbit. Explorer 1 discovered the Van Allen radiation belts and tracking of the, using the uh, solar cell powered Vanguard 1 yielded seven years of uh, seasonal atmospheric drag and density variations and revealed the Earth's pear shape obliqueness. These were interesting scientific uh, accomplishments, but the Soviet accomplishments to be, seemed to be far more impressive. Korolev placed an additional stage on the R-7 booster, making it powerful enough to send spacecraft to the moon. Following three failures in 1958, Luna 1 was launched in January 1959 and intended to impact on the moon. It passed uh, within 33,275 miles of the moon and instead went on into so solar orbit, the first man-made object to orbit the sun, another first for the Soviets. A second launch in June 1959 failed. The next attempt, September uh, 1959, was successful. It was called Luna 2 and it impacted the moon just south of the visible center in September of 1959. The first man-made object to reach the moon. Again, another Soviet uh, first. The next Luna spacecraft was fitted with photo television camera system 
with 40 frames of film. It would take pictures of the lunar far side never seen from Earth, develop the film on board, and then scan the pictures and transmit the images back to Earth. Luna 3 was launched September 1959 and looped around the moon where 29 photographs were taken over 40 minutes covering 40, 90%, 70% of the far side from a distance of about 40,000 40, miles. Once the spacecraft swung back closer to Earth again and signal strength was better, transmission of images began in October. They, uh, they continued for another week when the contact was lost. The pictures were grainy and with the sun overhead, so there was not much contrast. Nevertheless, a number of clearly visible features could be seen. Now that covered only one part of the moon. They were going to launch another set of uh, uh, photo missions that would uh, launch at a later date to take views of the far side of the moon from different aspect angles so that uh, they'd be, have complete coverage. But uh, those two failed. And you can see in the lower right uh, comparison of uh, one of the pictures that was taken versus uh, what is actually there. And there is, uh, you can see that this was not a fake, this was the real thing. Again, another first for the Soviet Union. The United States was finally able to launch its own satellites and probes starting in 1958. The first of the lunar missions were the Pioneer series, which would scan the moon from orbit by making uh, successive sweeps like a TV raster. All, for mission, all four missions failed because of ro booster rocket failures. The next series were the Ranger spacecraft. The two were Atlas Agena tests, where both failed. The next four missions attempted to conduct a soft lunar landing. All four failed because of booster rocket failures. The next four missions were, would provide imagery as they zoomed in on the moon for a crash. The last three of those were successful. So we finally had a successful lunar mission. Korolev was given directives to use the more powerful three-stage booster to develop reconnaissance satellites that could photograph targets of interest and then bring the exposed film back to Earth. He used the opportunity to develop a parallel program that would modify the reconnaissance spacecraft to carry animals into Earth orbit. The first launch occurred May of 1960, did not carry any animals on board. It was pointed in the wrong direction for retrofire, and that pushed it into a higher orbit. The descent module eventually re-entered the atmosphere with pieces falling in Wisconsin. The next launch occurred in uh, August of 1960, and it carried two dogs, Strelka and Belka. Three more launches were conducted. The first one failed. But those finally proved that it was possible to send a human into orbit. The United States officially announced Project Mercury in December 1958. Its goal was to put a man in orbit and return him safely to Earth, ideally before the Soviet Union. It would use monkeys and the human to conduct a series of suborbital ballistic which means just up and down flights, not into orbit, using the Mercury Redstone to be followed by orbital flights using the Mercury Atlas. Seven American astronauts were selected who would be launched from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Six crew missions were conducted. Two of them were ballistic, up and down, and four were orbital with splashdown recoveries in the Pacific, and the last two in the uh, I would say the first, the first of them in the Atlantic, the last two in the Pacific. Korolev selected 20 male Air Force pilots in March of 1960 to begin training as cosmonauts who would make orbital flights. No ballistic flights were planned like Mercury. They would fly in the spherical Vostok. The word Vostok means east capsule with its low center of gravity located on top of the instrument module, carrying attitude control thrusters, a liquid propellant retro rocket, electronics, and a power supply. The cosmonaut would sit on an ejection seat that would be used since both launch and landing would occur over land. At the completion of the mission, following retrofire and a successful reentry, the cosmonaut would eject from the capsule and both would land separately under their own parachute systems. On April 12, 1961, 
Soviet pilot cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin was launched into space on board Vostok 1 to become the first human to orbit the Earth, another first for the Soviet Union. The flight pan called for only one orbit lasting 108 minutes. Everything went fine until re-entry when an umbilical arm failed to release from the spherical capsule. Eventually, the heat of re-entry burned it through and re-entry was able to continue normally with separate parachute landings by Gagarin and his capsule. The Soviets had built a small city for the Cosmodrome, that's what they called the center, the Cosmodrome, south of Tiratam and called the city Leninsk. Now you might be wondering why the Cosmodrome is called Baikonur if the original village was called Tiratam and the workers' city was called Leninsk. When Yuri Gagarin became the first human to orbit the Earth, the Soviets wanted to register the accomplishments with the French Federation Astronautic International the World Air Sports Federation. One requirement was to state where the flight had started. Not wanting to acknowledge the location of the Cosmodrome, they picked a small mining village several hundred miles downrange, a village called Baikonur. Hence, from that point on, the center and the launch facility has been called the Baikonur Cosmodrome. They did not acknowledge initially that Gagarin had landed separately from his capsule fearing that it would jeopardize their claim for a successful flight from launch to landing. The Soviets went on to launch six Vostok capsules, each with more firsts. Yuri Gagarin became the first human to orbit the Earth. That was in April 1961. In August 1961, Germán Titov spent a full day in orbit, 16, 17 orbits. The next year, they launched two Vostoks a day apart, Andrea Nikolaev and Pavel Pavlovich, and uh, one of the capsules came within four miles of the other, and they spent several days in orbit. The next year, they launched two more, this time with a man, Valery Bakovsky and Valentina Tereshkova, and her spacecraft came within five miles of Vostok 5. Now, Valentina Tereshkova, on board Vostok 6, was the first woman to fly in space, having been selected from more than 400 applicants and five finalists. In order to join the Cosmonaut Corps, she was honorably inducted into the Soviet Air Force and thus also became the first civilian to fly in space. She was a textile worker who became interested in parachuting, making her first jump at age 22. It was her expertise in skydiving that led to her selection as a cosmonaut. After her flight, she studied at the Zyukovsky uh, Air Force Academy and graduated with distinction as a cosmonaut engineer. She went on to earn a doctorate in engineering and retired as a major general in the Soviet Air Force. She is revered as a hero and role model and was elected to the Soviet Dima state uh, Duma, the lower house of the Russian legislature. She married cosmonaut uh, Andrea Nikolaev from Vostok 3, and they had a daughter, Elena, who became a doctor and was the first person to have both a mother and father who had traveled in space, more first for the Soviet Union. Korolev Khrushchev demanded that Korolev conduct more missions. Uh, the Gemini program was coming up that would carry two astronauts, so he wanted uh, a space mission with three cosmonauts on board, and uh, they would use an upgraded version of the R-7 booster with a new, more powerful upper stage. To open up the interior, he took the Vostok spacecraft removed its ejection seat and replaced it with seats for three cosmonauts without pressure suits. Since it left no launch, of, or since it had, uh, it was with no launch abort escape rocket in case of an accident, this became an extremely dangerous configuration. A solid propellant uh, retro rocket was added on top to ensure a deorbit burn in case the primary unit failed. A solid propellant rocket was installed in the parachute shroud lines to cushion the descent just before touchdown. On October 12, 
1964, Voskhod, meaning sunrise, was launched with three uh, with a three-man crew, Vladimir Komarov, Konstantin Fyokustov, and Boris Yugurov, for a one-day mission, the first multi-crew mission, another first for the Soviet Union. Korolev's next mission was with a Voskhod spacecraft with one capable of conducting an EVA or spacewalk. Alexei Leonov and Pavel Belyev were launched on Voskhod 2 and marched 18, 19, 1965. At the end of the first orbit, Leonov inflated the flexible external airlock, opened an access hatch entering the airlock, depressurized the airlock, exited the airlock and performed an EVA spacewalk beginning over north central Africa and entering over, uh, ending over eastern Siberia. After his 12 minute and 9 second outside, Leonov's suit, which had never been tested in a total vacuum, had ballooned out and was so stiff that he could not re-enter the airlock. So he was forced to dangerously bleed off some of the suit's pressure in order to bend the joints before he could re-enter the cabin. But that EVA was another first for the Soviet Union. But that was not the end of the crew's problems. Just before the planned retrofire the next day, they realized that the automatic landing system had malfunctioned, forcing them to use the manual backup after a one orbit delay with an estimated time of retrofire. Like Vostok 1, the capsule did not completely separate from the instrument, mo instrument module causing the spherical return capsule to spin wildly until it burned through a, to separate the two modules. Uh, as a result of the 46 second delay, the capsule landed 930 miles farther east than where they were supposed to land in a dense forest in the middle of winter. A large birch tree pressed against the hatch, forcing them to use all their strength to push it open so they could slide out into the snow up to their chins. They had pistols with a, plenty of ammunition to fend off any aggressive bears and wolves because it was their mating season. <laughs> Aircraft eventually located them, but it was getting dark, so they had to spend the night there in the capsule with the open hatch. Leonov's suit was up to his knees in sweat from his EVA. Clothing was dropped to them. They recovered boots and gloves, but the rest got caught in the trees. They stripped down naked and wrung out much of the sweat, as, as much of the sweat as they could uh, from their suits before putting them back on. They could not pull down the parachute to cover the open hatch, so they spent the night in their seats at 22 degrees below uh, Fahrenheit. The next morning, rescue crews arrived, cut down enough trees five miles away for the cosmonauts to ski out to a safe landing. <laughs> So that was quite an adventure to say the least. We never learned about that until many years later. Korolev had to turn his attention to lunar missions as well before any nation could send humans to the moon. We had to know more about it. Would you sink into a thick layer of dust? Was radiation a hazard? Where were the best locations for a landing and so on? Therefore, each nation developed a series of robotic probes to explore the moon up close. For the Soviet Union's probes were launched with an upgraded version of the R-7 called Melnya, meaning lightning, with an Earth orbit escape stage. The probe and escape stage would be placed in Earth orbit, and uh, once it was back over the Soviet Union after completing an orbit, uh, it was uh, it would be uh, it would fire the uh, rocket to send it on its way to the moon. The probe would make a mid-course correction if required to refine its trajectory to place it in the correct location when it arrived at the moon. Korolev used the name Luna for its lunar exploration missions. The spacecraft would consist of a propulsion unit with a 220-pound spherical soft lander capsule on top. Two side compartments would serve as communication modules and a radar altimeter. At 50 miles above the moon, those side compartments would be jettisoned to lighten the load, and red tube burn would start. A small ground contact road, rod would extend from the side to indicate when touchdown had been reached. At that point, the engine would shut down, 
two halves of a protective bag over the probe would inflate and it would eject from the propulsion unit to land separately. The bag halves would then separate to expose the spherical probe. Korolev began this new series with the first launch in 1963. Luna 4 failed its mid-course correction maneuver. From 1963 to 1966, 11 launch attempts were made to reach the moon. Six failed to reach Earth orbit. Luna 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 either missed the moon entirely or did not slow down enough and impacted the moon. Korolev's OKB workload had grown so large that various programs were transferred to other organizations. The lunar program was transferred to the Lovachkin OKB 301 Bureau. Korolev died on January 14, 1966 from health problems brought on by his detention in the Soviet uh, prison camps. Finally, on February 3, 1966, Luna 9 was able to perform a soft landing, another first for the Soviet Union. After coming to rest, four pedal sections opened up to release communication antennas and uncover a periscope cam scanning camera on top. Over eight hours, it transmitted three separate 360-degree uh, scans, showing that the surface was hard and that the radiation level uh, measured only 30 millirads another first for the Soviet Union. The next lander, Luna 13, uh, was launched in December 1966. It had a second sc scanning camera on top to provide stereoscopic images of the surface, but it failed to work. It also had two mechanical arms that extended from the protective, when the protective uh, pedals opened. One contained a soil me measuring penetrometer to measure soil compactness. The other contained a radiation densitometer that radiated the soil to determine soil composition. It was the third probe to land on the moon. The second one was the NASA ex uh, Surveyor 1, America's first attempt at a lunar lander. So there was quite a difference between what Russian accomplished in terms of landing attempts and America. The Soviets had accomplished the first lunar soft landing. Their next opportunity was to put Luna 10 into orbit around the moon in April 1966. The soft lander was replaced with a heavier orbiter spacecraft, 546 pounds, because it takes less propellant to achieve orbit rather than land on the moon. It contained a number of scientific instruments as well as a recording of the Communist International that was to be broadcast at a meeting of the Kremlin where 5,000 delegates of the 23rd Congress of the Commune of Partisi was going to be held. On the eve of the event, controllers conducted a rehearsal of the of broadcast, which went fine. The next day, in a final test, they discovered that one of the oscillators had failed because the music was skipped. Engineers substituted the perfect recording from the previous night transmission with the announcement that, the cre that uh, it was the creation of the first artificial satellite of the moon, another first for the Soviet Union. Soviets wanted to get close-up images of landing sites. Luna 11 launched two weeks after the U.S. Lunar Orbiter 1 entered orbit on uh, August 27, 1966. That, that mission failed to take any pictures because the spacecraft was not properly oriented to face the lunar surface. The other onboard instruments functioned without fault until the power supply had been depleted. There was no solar batteries on board to keep it going. Luna 12 entered orbit October, uh, or, yeah, October 25th, 1966 and was the first Soviet spacecraft to take close-up pictures of the moon from orbit. The film was developed, fixed, dried automatically, and scanned for transmission to Earth. It is not known how many pictures were taken, <coughs> and only a few images have ever been published. Luna 14 was placed in lunar orbit and was said to be a test for communication systems to support a future program to send cosmonauts to the moon. With better and more powerful launch vehicles, the United States began a series of spacecraft to provide better understanding of the moon. Five lunar orbiter spacecraft were used, uh, an onboard film system, 
film camera system to photograph potential Apollo landing sites as well as provide full coverage of the lunar far side. All five missions were successful. The Surveyor spacecraft landed on the moon and provided detailed characteristics of the surface showing it was safe for the Apollo astronauts. Five of the missions were successful. So even though we were late, we had a much more impressive uh, record of successes. The Soviet Union began to flounder after Voskhod. As a result, there were several contenders for new launch vehicles and space programs. Vladimir Chalamet had hired Korolev's son, Sergei, into his design bureau and was rewarded with a big contract to develop a large launch vehicle for military crewed space stations. His heavy proton UR-500, standing for universal rocket, booster was capable of launching 18 tons of payload into Earth orbit. Unfortunately, it was powered by engines from Gleshko's design bureau that used very toxic, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide propellants. And disputes between Glushko and Korolev dated back to the 1930s, when Glushko's testimony helped to put Korolev in a forced labor camp. As a result, when Korolev approached Glushko to develop, to develop large kerosene liquid oxygen engines for a future heavy booster of his own, Glushko refused because he preferred storable hypergolic propellants that ignite on impact on contact. Glushko wanted an additional stage for his heavy, for heavy lunar and planetary spacecraft. So he took the final stage called Block D that Korolev was developing that would become the Proton K. The Soviets watched the continuing success of Americans and began to realize that they might not be the first to land cosmonauts on the moon. There was the possibility they could conduct unmanned missions that would uh, duplicate some of the things that Apollo was planning to do, return soil samples, place roving vehicles on the moon. Doing so, they could claim that they accomplished everything at much less expense and safer unmanned missions. The Lobotchkin OKB-301 Design Bureau was given responsibility to take over lunar and planetary spacecraft by Korola, starting with Luna 9. They developed totally new five and a half ton metric ton lunar spacecraft capable of being launched on a Proton K for lunar, for lunar missions. There would be orbiters, surface rovers, and soil sample return spacecraft with the Apollo 11 mission scheduled to land astronauts on the moon in summer of 1969. The Soviets tried to be ready to ready their spacecraft to conduct missions ahead of the Americans. An attempt to launch a surface rover in, on February 19, 1969 failed to reach orbit. A, a uh, soil sample return spacecraft failed to reach orbit on June 14, 1969. And finally, Luna 15 was successfully launched on July 13, 1969, with the attempt of bringing back lunar soil just ahead of Apollo 11. It crashed attempting to land, leaving Apollo 11 to be a total success for the Americans when it landed on the moon ahead of the Soviet Union. Three more lunar soil sample return spacecraft missions failed all after Apollo 11 had brought back about 50 pounds of lunar rocks and soil samples. Finally, on September 20, 1970, Luna 16 successfully landed on the moon, lowering a hollow drill tube to the surface, boring into the lunar soil, then raising the drill tube with the sample collection to a return capsule, sealed it in the capsule, blasted off, and returned it to Earth. Hard rock had been counted just one and a half inches down with a drill so it didn't penetrate very far, so only 3.6 ounces of soil from the lunar maria, the dark lava flow regions, was returned. Luna 20 conducted a very successful lunar soil sample return mission. It was launched February 14, 1960, 1972, this time to the lunar highlands. After encounter, encountering hard rock, that the drill could not penetrate, and it back, brought back only 1.9 ounces of soil. These were just a fraction of the 842 pounds of lunar samples 
that were brought back by the Apollo astronauts. The spacecraft was then modified to carry a drill that could collect a 7.4 long tube of lunar soil, much like filling a tube of, of a sausage. And you can see in the diagram, the pictures, how the, uh, the tube would work as it went down the uh, uh, soil would uh, accumulate in the tube. It would then be uh, rolled up on a spool uh, and it would be uh, passed into the return capsule. The return capsule would then close off and it would uh, um, be sent back to Earth. Luna 23 probably landed on ground even enough that it tipped over, preventing it from ever completing its mission. Luna 24 launched August 9, 1976, and brought back six ounces of lunar Maria material well after the Apollo missions had ended in 1972. Astronauts on the uh, last Apollo mission spent three days on the moon before returning to Earth. The Soviets had designed a lunar rover capable of operating for months on the moon. A launch attempt ahead of Apollo 11 on February 1969 failed. Luna 17 was followed. It was successful and landed on the moon November 17, 1970. Once there, ramps were lowered to allow the Luna Cod 1 to roll off and onto the lunar surface. It traveled 6.55 miles during 322 Earth days of operation, and it returned over 20,000 TV images, over 200 high-resolution panoramas, and conducted analyses at 500 different locations. Powers was provided by a solar cell array that opened during the day and closed at night. A small nuclear source heated the interior during the cold two-week long lunar night. The Soviets conducted one more lunar rover for mission. Luna 21 landed on the moon uh, January 1957, 1973, allowing Luna Cod 2 to roll off and begin its mission like Luna Cod 1. It uh, was fitted with panoramic cameras, uh, cameras on its side. This time it had a third forward looking camera to provide both horizontal and vertical stereoscopic views for the drivers back on Earth to plan its travel route. Like the previous rover, it contained a laser retroreflector to perform precise ranging from Earth. It also had sensors to measure solar X-ray and soil properties as well as the local magnetic field. Lunacod 2 traveled 24.2 miles compared with Apollo 17's rover that was 22.1 miles. So a slightly longer trip for the Lunacod. During its four months of life, it sent back uh, nearly 70,000 TV images and six, 86 panoramas of the surrounding area. Two more launch Lunacods were built but never launched. The Soviets had planned to send cosmonauts to the moon, so they needed imagery of potential landing sites. The Lunacod spacecraft was taken and the wheels and ramps and nuclear heater were removed and more photographic equipment was added. Luna 19 was launched in 1971 and Luna 22 launched in 1974, with each placed in orbit around the moon. Once in lunar orbit, they proceeded to produce panoramic images of the moon, determining the chemical composition of the lunar surface, recorded micrometeorite activity, and started the irregular magnetic field the spacecraft made various orbit adjustments in order to conduct extensive studies of the shape and strength of the lunar gravitational field and the locations of mass cons, variations in density that will alter the shape of a spacecraft's lunar orbit. In May, on May 25, 1961, President John Kennedy announced before a joint session of Congress that the U.S. would conduct itself would commit itself to achieving the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. This was the beginning of what would become the Apollo manned lunar program. The American Apollo lunar program would see the Gemini program go to completion. It would then go on to the, uh, it would see the Mercury program go to completion. It would then see the Gemini program 
that would develop a two astronaut spacecraft capable of conducting EVA, extravehicular activity, spacewalks, and rendezvous and docking in Earth orbit as rehearsals for Apollo. Korolev had a number of follow-on missions that he could conduct with his cosmos, but Voskhod was too dangerous for all future missions using a Voskhod, uh, which had, so, so all future Voskhod missions were canceled. Instead, he concentrated on prospects of docking spacecraft in Earth orbit to a similar vehicle that could fly around the moon. He had only the R-7 family of boosters that could put uh, six and a half tons in Earth orbit, so he proposed a series of spacecraft that would make a circumlunar flyby. Tanker spacecraft would make multiple launches to dock with and fill a propulsion module. Once that was a completed, a crew would be launched and dock with the propulsion module that would then carry, uh, would then send, be sent on a flight around the moon and back. The propulsion tanker and spacecraft, the propulsion module and tanker spacecraft were never got off the drawing board, but the 7K crew vehicle would eventually evolve into the Soyuz, meaning Union, 7K OK near-Earth orbit spacecraft with variants uh, that are still in use today. All of the crewed spacecraft carry a 7K designation. The Vostok Voskhod spacecraft did not have the capability to maneuver in space nor dock with other spacecraft. So Korolev moved on to a new Soyuz spacecraft. It consisted of three modules, a spherical orbital module where the crew could reside once in orbit, a beehive-shaped descent module where the crew would reside during launch and re-entry, and an instrument module containing the propulsion system and electronics. And attached to the instrument module were a set of solar cell panels to supplement batteries for power once in space. Soyuz 1 consisted of an active and passive, Soyuz consisted of an active and passive docking spacecraft. Soyuz 1 was launched in uh, April 1967 with Vladimir Komarov on board. The planned launch of, us, of Soyuz 2 the next day was canceled when problems developed with Soyuz 1. Korolev, uh, Komarov made a successful re-entry, but his parachute system failed to properly deploy, and he died on impact. Another sad first for the Soviet Union. The United States had lost three astronauts in the Apollo 1 fire in January 67, just three months before Soyuz 1. Following the death of Komarov, the Soviets spent a year and a half redesigning the Soyuz. NASA lost a similar amount of time with work on Apollo. After several launches without a cosmonaut, they were ready to try again. Soyuz 2 was launched without a cosmonaut, followed by Soyuz 3 with Gergi Bergovoy on board. He was able to rendezvous with Soyuz 2, but failed to dock with it. Soyuz 4 with Vladimir Shatalov and Soyuz 5 with Boris Volnyov, <laughs> uh, Alexei Volnyenkov and uh, Ivani Krenov were launched in January 1969 and were able to dock in orbit. <laughs> Yeliseyev and Krenov then donned space chutes and performed a spacewalk from Soyuz 5 over to Soyuz 4. This may have seemed like a stunt, but it was going to be part of their lunar landing program. This sort of activity was to be part of their lunar landing program. The Soyuz had three modules or sections. For re-entry, the orbital module was jettisoned first, followed by a re-entry, a retroburn by the instrument module. For Soyuz 5, after retrofire, the instrument module failed to separate completely, plunging the spacecraft into the atmosphere nose first exposing the unprotected uh, capsule hatch. Fortunately, the heat of re-entry re burned away enough of the instrument module connections that the re-entry module was able to separate and right itself. The parachute developed, uh, uh, deployed s safely, but its lines became entangled and the landing retro rockets failed to fire 
resulting in a hard landing that almost wrecked the capsule. Volnia uh, was thrown around during all of this and ended up breaking several front teeth. <laughs> so, in August 1964, the Central Committee of the Soviet Communist Party finally passed a reg resolution uh, to put cosmonauts on the moon before the Apollo program. Uh, this was two years after the start of the American Apollo program. Three design bureaus submitted proposals for the program phases to meet uh, this resolution. The Soviets had so much success up to that, that point that they were confident they could beat the Americans to be first on the moon. Korolev proposed it to be a series of steps. L1 for, you know, learner, Luna Learner 1 was to develop and test a launch and recovery capsule for the cosmonauts. L2 would be a remote control rover for use by the cosmonauts on the moon. L3 would be a spacecraft to send cosmonauts to the moon and back. L4 would be an extended stay manned lunar orbiter research station. And L5 would be a heavy mobile surface research vehicle for extended stay cosmonauts. Korolev set about planning his L-1 phase for the Soviet program to place cosmonauts on the moon, hopefully ahead of the Americans. In part to develop a manned craft for their lunar program, the Soviets would start with a stripped-down version of the Soyuz called the 7K L-1. There's that 7K designation again. And it was called Zond, which means probe. It would eliminate the spherical orbital module and use a descent module with a heavier heat shield. It would be launched on a Proton K launch vehicle with Karlov's new Block D stage on top. It would eliminate one of the two Soyuz parachute compartments and carry two cosmonauts on a circum circumlunar flight, a lunar flyby that would not enter lunar orbit. And it would return uh, by flying over the South Pole with a skip re-entry to land in the Soviet Union. And you can see in the lower right what that skip reentry means. It means plowing into the atmosphere to lose a little bit of speed, but then it would rise up and out of the moon, uh, out of the atmosphere. And then it, when it finally dipped in again, it was going slow enough that it could make a successful uh, reentry and landing. The Zon launch and recovery capsule was a modified Soyuz descent module. Only a few pictures of the interior have been released. There's a large central control panel in front of the cosmonauts and another smaller one to the right. Since there was no orbital module, what was a Soyuz third uh, cosmonaut seat on the left was replaced with a rack containing the life support system. And uh, in the bottom, you can see some pictures of the uh, interior uh, looking through a hatch. The Zahn program got to a late start in December 1965, decree calling for the production of 14 spacecraft. The first one would be a ground test engineering mock-up that would never, it was never intended to fly. The next two would be simplified versions, prototypes, used primarily to develop launches of the Proton K with its new Block D upper stage that had never flown before. The next six numbers Four through nine would be unmanned rehearsal and development flights of the Zahn spacecraft. Once two of them had successfully conducted missions, the remaining spacecraft numbers 11 through 14 would take cosmonauts on board. As these plans were put into place, it was always hoped that a manned circumlunar mission could be conducted to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Soviet Union in November 1967. The first launch was uh, successful uh, by sending it into a highly elliptical Earth orbit. The next one failed to leave Earth orbit because the Block D had a wrong switch setting. Neither launch was aimed at the moon and no recovery of the spacecraft was planned. The next launch carried a Zond spacecraft but failed when one of the Proton K first stage engines failed to ignite. The next launch failed when only three of the four second stage engines uh, ignited. 7K L1 number six was successfully launched in March of 1968. Given the designation Zond 4, it was launched into a highly elliptical orbit away from the moon and then head back to Earth with a first re-entry dip 
occurring over the Gulf of Guinea uh, off the coast of Africa. The spacecraft was intended to make a skip re-entry with a final landing at Baikonur when it appeared that it was not going to come out of the first plunge into the atmosphere. It, would, it was blown up using the onboard destruct charges over the coast of Africa to prevent the re-entry vehicle from falling into foreign hands. Uh, launch number seven failed when a sensor uh, problem developed, sending a signal shut down to shut down the booster early. Number eight was prepared on the launch pad when the Block D liquid oxygen tank was accidentally overpressurized and ruptured, killing one technician and injuring another. This caused the payload to partially collapse and lean over on one side stopping only when the launch escape system came in to rest against the gantry. Part of the Block D crushed down onto the Proton K third stage, leaving everything in a hazardous, highly explosive state. It took two weeks to slowly, uh, of slow strenuous work to drain off propellants, remove explosive charges, and dismantle everything else, including the Zon, all of the while mindful of a potential explosion. And it's not kn known if that Zon spacecraft was ever salvaged. Number nine was successfully launched September 1968 on a circumlunar mission, and it was called Zon 5. Photographs taken of the Earth and Moon during the fl uh, flyby. Sensor problems were encountered during the mission, preventing a double dip atmospheric reentry. During 20 hours of capable, careful maneuvering, and firings uh, brought it into the required reentry corridor where it performed a 60 G, that's uh, 60 times the normal Earth gravity uh, pull, ballistic reentry and landing in the Indian Ocean, about 60 miles from one of their recovery ships. Uh, in addition to photographic equipment, it carried biological specimens, two tortoises, distrustophilus, fly eggs, various dry seeds and plants, and biological cultures. The recovered Zond 5 was transported to Bombay and then flown back to Moscow where it's on display today. Number 12 was called Zond 6. It made a successful lunar flyby, photographing the Earth and near and far sides of the moon along the way. It made a successful skip re-entry into, uh, into the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, it experienced a cabin pressure leak that disrupted the gamma ray altimeter causing it to re release the parachutes at high altitude. The free fall destroyed the capsule on impact a mere five miles from where it had been launched just seven days before. Crews carefully dismantled and recovered what was left, including film cartridges that yield high color, quality color pictures of the earth and moon, giving the impression in the press that the mission had been successful. In December 1968, the Apollo 8 mission placed three American astronauts into lunar orbit, a feat far greater than anything Zon was capable of accomplishing. Nevertheless, number 13 was, getting, was made ready for launch in January 1969. It failed when one of the second stage engines shut down early and then the third stage shut down entirely. Apollo 11 conducted the first manned lunar landing on July 20, 1969, ending all hope of the Soviets beating the Americans to the moon. Nevertheless, 7K L1 number 11 called Zon 7 was launched towards the moon in 19, uh, August 1969 and was the first one to conduct a completely successful mission from beginning to end. This final launch was uh, number 14, given the designation Zond 8. It conducted a successful circumlunar mission, conducted photographic sessions of the moon, Earth and Moon and on the way. The Soviets planned to return the spacecraft with cosmonauts on, on board, would have it pass over the South Pole before landing in the Soviet Union. That was called the Southern Route and successfully conducted with Zond 7. So for von Zond 8, the entry re-entry path was changed to the northern route so it would pass over the Soviet Union first with its set of tracking stations for a most precise trajectory determined. It then uh, landed as planned in the Indian Ocean just 15 miles from its target. It was recovered, taken to Bombay, and then flown to Moscow. 
In July 1968, the CIA warned NASA of a possible Soviet manned Zond circumlunar flight in the near future. This warning led NASA to move up the date for the Apollo 8 mission that would place three astronauts into lunar orbit in December 1968. This was an extremely risky mission because it would carry, not carry a lunar module that proved to be a lifeboat during the failed Apollo 13 mission. We now know that the Soviets had planned to try and launch their next Zond ahead of Apollo 8. Some of the cosmonauts had petitioned to make it a manned mission, contending that they could correct any possible problems that might develop in flight. Without two successful, uh, completed uh, missions at that point, those requests were turned down. So the United States lunar program to place a man on the moon began in 1968 with President Kennedy's declaration. After extensive studies, it was decided that the lunar orbit rendezvous would be the flight mode, launching everything on a single rocket with pieces that would separate and redock in lunar orbit before a return to Earth. Two spacecraft would be developed, a command service module and a lunar module. Testing would be conducted uh, with launches into Earth orbit on a smaller Saturn 1B launch vehicle to test each spacecraft separately. Then a larger Saturn V launch vehicle would be used to conduct the lunar landing missions. A much larger launch vehicle than the Proton K would be required to conduct, to conduct the Soviet manned lunar landing missions. Each of these major design bureaus submitted proposals to meet this requirement. The Yangle OKB 586 Design Bureau had built a series of military missiles such as the SS-4 and 5 uh, that was, was installed in Cuba in 1962 and the giant SS-18 NATO named Satan ICBM. He proposed a lunar design that would simply strap together pieces from these to form an R-56 lunar booster. It seemed to get no further than a design study and was ultimately rejected. Chalamet came up with a design, design called the UR-700 universal rocket that consisted of a series of cylindrical tanks to form a multi-stage booster. It would use toxic chemicals, toxic propellants, and would only carry one cosmonaut to the moon and back. His design was rejected and never got beyond the design stage with mock-ups of the lunar lander spacecraft. And there you can see the Saturn V, and I'll talk about the Korolev N1 in just a moment, and Cholomay's, Cholomay's uh, UR-700, which is much smaller. Korolev's design, called the N1 L3, was ultimately selected. It was a launch vehicle that would uh, was roughly the same height as the Saturn V used for the Apollo program. Glushko refused to develop kerosene liquid oxygen engines for Korolev, so Korolev had to go to the Kuznetsov OKB-276 design bureau for engines. Kuznetsov had built only aircraft engines and never any rocket engines. Korolev needed 30 of his engines for the first stage, eight for the second stage, and four for the third stage. You can see on the uh, far right pictures of the first stage, second stage, and third stage with all of the engines involved. For the L3 lunar program, there were two additional stages under a payload shroud that housed the lunar spacecraft that would require one additional engine each. The five stages would receive severe Cyrillic alphabet numbers, A, B, V, G, D, so that block D was the final stage in the N1 vehicle. Unlike the Saturn V with its upper stages powered by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, the N1 L3 would use kerosene liquid oxygen for all of its stages. The last stage, block D, continues to be used for the proton K. Like Apollo, the Soviets agreed that a lunar orbit rendezvous was the best approach for their missions. They would use the giant N-1 launch vehicle that would carry two new L-3 spacecraft for landing missions. A 7K LOK lunar orbiter based upon the Soyuz and a totally new LK lander. And there you can see what uh, all of those were to look like. 
the 7K LOK looked like a, like a standard Soyuz. It needed a much bigger block I propulsion system in the base for maneuvering and docking with the LK once it came back up from the, from the moon. It would then be used to perform a trans-Earth injection burn out of lunar orbit and back to Earth. To save weight, an ex internal tunnel to the LK was eliminated and instead a single lunar lander cosmonaut would exit the orbital module, perform an EVA back to the LK, the DOK unit on top of the orbital module contains steering engines and ma the ma to maneuver the whole assembly during the flight to the moon. Instead of solar saddles, it would carry a hydrogen oxygen fuel cells in the base of the instrument uh, module, much like what powered the, what powered the uh, Apollo spacecraft. Korolev's original plan was to send two men, two cosmonauts, to the moon for a mission. However, when all of the detailed calculations were done, it was realized that the N1 simply could not carry a heavy enough load to accomplish that. Therefore, the lander weight had to be cut back so it could carry only a single cosmonaut down to the lunar surface and back. And here you can see a picture of the proposed two-man versions of the LK with two uh, cosmonauts inside the cabin. The LK, LK lander did not have an internal tunnel to the LOK. Instead, a harpoon on the LOK would mate with a set of honeycomb cells on a disc on top of the LK to attach the two spacecraft at the completion of the surface mission. Directly below the disc were the attitude control thrusters for steering during descent and ascent. Entry into the interior was through a hatch on the side, uh, leading to a ladder down to the surface of the moon. And there you can see a picture of me in one of the lunar landers, uh, standing at the base of it on the far left. And then the picture to the uh, right of that is me uh, in the uh, open hatchway of the lander. Since there was only a single cosmonaut on the moon, the Soviets had made the spacesuits easy to get off and on and off. The solution was to make the Kretschet, which is uh, Russian for a golden falcon, with a hard torso and helmet and soft, flexible, soft fabric, flexible arms and legs. Entry would be with a back door that would allow the cosmonaut to slip his arms and legs in put his face up against the helmet visor and then close the door. A lever handle uh, by his right elbow could then be, uh, he could reach out to close and latch and seal the suit. A chest mounted control panel could monitor uh, the suit status when it was outside. The suit could uh, operate for 10 hours before requiring a resupply of consumables. The suit had two snap-down visors providing different levels of sun protection in addition to a clear visor. The outer visor was coated in gold for reflection. And there you can see uh, pictures of the suit itself with the back door that would allow the cosmonauts to climb inside. And that orange structure is a uh, structure to be able to hold uh, the suit in place uh, so it could be stored upright. The LK cabin interior features a cluster of instrument panels around a single viewport directly in front of the cosmonaut looking down at the surface. The environmental control system was on the right. There was a frame that the cosmonaut would use to lock the rigid torso of his spacesuit and legs into place while he controlled the final descent and ascent. This was necessary to maintain the correct center of gravity. He had 15 to 20 seconds of hover time to maneuver up to 350 feet to select his final landing location. And there you can see pictures of the uh, instrumentation in the interior. Plans were to put in place to test various pieces of hardware before any lunar mission could be conducted. The LOK was to be tested in Earth orbit on a modified T1K spacecraft that never happened. Instead, they would test it during the N1 test launches. The LK lunar lander propulsion system was tested three times 
on T2 case spacecraft in Earth orbit, and each time with total success using Cosmo, Cosmos program names. The Block E primary engine propulsion system would be used for the final phase of lunar landing. A big uh, communication disk dishes at the, at the end of the lunar stay, uh, it would be shed with the landing support structure, big communication dishes. It would uh, fire up the same primary engine and return to lunar orbit. If there was a problem, a dual chamber backup engine could be used. Uh, the West had no knowledge at the time of the purpose of these tests. So if you take a look in the lower left, the first burn uh, after it achieved a lunar orbit was to simulate the final phase of lunar landing. And then the second one was to simulate the uh, launch from the lunar surface back up into lunar orbit. And the color picture on the right shows the uh, engine with the primary single chamber in the engine and the double chamber. Uh, it's actually four chambers. Uh, of the backup engine. The Block D was to play a role in the lunar mission and it was used primarily to perform mid-course corrections, lunar orbit insertion, lunar orbit adjustments, and the start of power descent to the lunar surface. Two rehearsal missions were planned while in Earth orbit. A November 28, 1969 launch failed when the proton booster fate exploded. Cosmos 328 Again, they use that cosmos for a whole series of spacecraft to disguise what their purposes were. Cosmos 328 was successfully launched into orbit December 1970, uh, and it performed extensive maneuvering, including a significant orbital plane change for the final burn. A 7K L1E SOM spacecraft provided guidance and control for the attached Block D cameras inside the Block D uh, monitored propellant activity inside the tanks during the mission. Cosmos 328 is still in orbit today. Again, at the time, the West had no knowledge of the purpose of these launches, and it is only it is the only lunar hardware still in orbit today. So, of the burns that were conducted, the first one was uh, to simulate lunar orbit insertion. The next would be a series of uh, minor uh, lunar orbit adjustments, and then the final burn simulated the start of the lunar descent burn. Testing of the end at one was to be conducted in stages. The first launches would carry just a modified Zon L1S that would uh, be put into lunar orbit using uh, the Block D. Uh, there it would conduct photographic activity before uh, sent back to Earth by the Block D. Later missions would carry unmanned L3 spacecraft for testing before conducting any manned missions. A DOK module on top of the LOK would be used for attitude control of the whole assembly, so one was carried on top of the Zon. Korolev realized that with so many engines running at the base of the N1, there was a possible problem that one of the engines would fail, causing an asymmetry in the developed, in the generated thrust. The solution was a cord system that would shut down the diagonally opposite engine as well to maintain symmetry. For example, if engine number 12 shut down, the opposite engine number 24 would shut down as well. As by the cord system, a mission could still conduct, be conducted successfully if two engine pairs were shut down. And there you can see again, you know, the cluster of engines at the base of the launch vehicle. The Soviets had limited funding for their program, so they decided to forego a test stand for the N1 first stage with its 30 engines and resolve and correct any anomalies following an actual launch. The first two N1s were ground test vehicles not intended to be launched. L3 was launched February 1969, but failed when fire broke out in one of the in the engine bay of the first stage, and the cord shut down all of the engines. It crashed 32 miles downrange. 
L4, 4L was uh, sent back after welding cracks were discovered in the fuel tanks. L5 was launched on July 3rd, 1969, just ahead of Apollo 11. It failed with an explosion in the engine bay just 10.5 seconds after, launch, after ignition. The cord commanded the shutdown of all but one of the 30 engines, causing it to crash back on the launch pad, totally destroying it. L6 failed in June 1971 when it began rotating at nearly 40 degrees per second, twisting the second stage away from the third. Uh, L7L failed in November 1972 when lines to the inner six engines ruptured in the first stage, uh, uh, causing an explosion and fire in the engine bay and the vehicle destruction. So further, further launch attempts, uh, no further launches attempts were ever made. So all had failed because of first stage problems. So what would a Soviet lunar mission have looked like? Korolev's main lunar mission profile would begin with the first three stages of the N1L3 launch to achieve Earth orbit. The assembly would begin, it would, re <coughs> would remain in Earth orbit for a day while all systems were checked out. The fourth stage, Block G, would then perform a translunar injection burn to send the whole assembly onto the moon. The fifth stage, Block D, would perform mid-course corrections during the outbound uh, cruise phase. Upon arrival, the fifth stage, Block D, would perform a lunar orbit injection burn to place the whole assembly into a lunar orbit. After some maneuvering, the Block D and uh, LK lander would then descend to the moon. After the surface stay, the LK uh, lander would return to lunar orbit and dock with the LOK orbiter before returning to Earth. If the single lunar surface cosmonaut encountered any problems with his LK and was unable to return to lunar orbit, he would be marooned. The solution was to conduct four launches for a single lunar mission. The first two would be Proton K launched rovers, designated uh, 38A and B, for the single cosmonaut to use on the lunar surface. That would be followed by a N1 L3 launch that would place an unmanned LKR, meaning reserve, on the moon. One of the E-8 rovers would then approach the LKR and do a visual inspection for any damage. Once telemetry and instrumentation, uh, once telemetry and imagery had determined that it was safe, the final launch would take place with two cosmonauts on an L N1 L3. If problems were encountered with the LK after landing, the single cosmonaut could take his E-8 rover over to the LKR reserve spacecraft to complete a surface mission. <laughs> so it was pretty bizarre. The lunar spacecraft would enter an initial 95 mile high orbit around the moon. Careful ranging measurements would be taken to the landing site of the LKR. The orbit would then be lowered to 12 by 65 miles. Once everything was ready for the landing phase, the cosmonauts would enter the LOK orbital module, don their spacesuits, and would then depressurize the orbital module, and a single lunar lander cosmonaut would use a swing arm to transfer from the LOK to a hatch leading to the LK that was inside a protective support shroud. Once inside the LK, he would guide the LK and attach Block D out of the shroud and drift away to a safe distance. Once safely out, the, sh the shroud at the base of the LOK would be jettisoned. At the proper time, the Block D would then perform a power descent burn to drop the whole assembly out of lunar orbit and head down to the surface. There was a problem with jettisoning the empty Block D just before landing because the LK might come down right on top of it. So the assembly would perform a loop maneuver to send the LK off to the side away from the Block D that had crashed nearby. And there you can see the uh, 
landing attempt where the two would separate. <clears throat> when the first leg of the lander touched down, little thrusters on each leg would fire to force each leg down to the surface. This ensured that when the OK head com was completely down uh, and the main engine was shut off, the length of each leg would have been adjusted so that the whole spacecraft was upright and would not be tilting. Once off the, on the surface, after checking all the systems, the cosmonaut would open the hatch, descend down the ladder, begin his surface activity. He would install a state flag of the Soviet Union and lunar science instru scientific instruments, collect samples of lunar soil, conduct a TV report, take photos of the LK and landing site. Uh, in the suggested image uh, center below, uh, uh, the cosmonaut would set out two seismometers and a tethered mini rover powered by batteries at the base of the LK that would continue to operate after the cosmonaut was gone. Other suggestions included a power drill to take and retrieve a, a core soil core sample. For the most first mission, he would be on the moon for about four hours. At the completion of the first mission, surface mission, he would blast off to rejoin the LOK in orbit. Both cosmonauts would use the orbital module of the LOK as living quarters during the flight to the moon and while in lunar orbit. The surviving unit shown on the left at the Moscow Aviation Institute was cut in half for engineering students. The half on the left features an open hatch a open bay that would hold one of the spacesuits. The big gray unit is a large panoramic camera, film camera, to be used while in lunar orbit. The other half shows a similar rack for the other spacesuits. Presumably, the rest of the open space was filled with food and supplies. The picture on the right from another interior in the Energia Museum with a big camera unit on the right shows the controls for as many as seven different camera systems. Once the LK had returned to lunar orbit, the LOK would track it down and perform rendezvous and docking with the LK. A seat would swing down from the ceiling to hold the cosmonaut in place while he was working. He would use a small cupola on the, in the, with a window looking forward and an instrument panel with hand controls to conduct the maneuvering. This display would show range, range rate, and a TV instrument in image as he approached the LK. Weight was always a problem as the Soviets planned a lunar mission. As a result, docking of the LOK and the LK would have to be performed with a harpoon-like probe that would aim at a honeycomb array on top of the LK. Once attached, the surface cosmonaut could move from the LK back to the LOK via EVA, carrying his collection of lunar soil samples and fill cassettes. Once both cosmonauts were safely inside the orbital module, they could close the hatch, repressurize the orbital module, shed their spacesuits, and relax, having completed the lunar surface mission uh, phase of the lunar surface phase of the mission. Only one LOK descent module seems to exist, one at the Korolev College of Space Engineering and Technology. It appears to be an early engineering model with one seat and an equipment rack inside. It has been trashed so that we don't have a good example to look at it. Uh, elsewhere, information about the control panels have been trust published so we know a little bit about the interior. Unlike Soyuz with two parachute compartments, the LOK had a single large one. Once the surface cosmonaut was back in the LOK and the two cosmonauts had shed their spacesuits, they would climb into the descent module with the film cassettes and soil samples. The two cosmonauts would then shed the orbital module and its attached LK ascent stage. The propulsion system of the LOK would then perform a trans-Earth injection burn to send them back safely to Earth. The return trajectory would take them over the South Pole before re-entering the instrument module would be jettisoned, leaving just the re-entry module uh, to make a double-dip re-entry over the Indian Ocean and then land back in the Soviet Union. 
And the picture below is uh, of another uh, spacecraft coming back in where the uh, uh, unprotected uh, spacecraft body uh, support structure is burning on re-entry and the little red dot, a little uh, white dot is the actual spacecraft itself protected with a heat shield. So all that would come back from the moon is just the uh, Soyuz-like uh, descent module capsule that you see on the right. It now appears that L3 was put in place simply to beat Apollo for the first manned lunar landing. L3 was so limited that there was no opportunity to match the things that Apollo was able to accomplish. Two men on the moon at the same time, three-day stays, bringing back pounds rather than ounces of lunar soil, and etc. Therefore, after the Apollo program had gone to completion in 1972, there was no more L3-specific program launches. NASA had the Apollo application programs to be able to conduct missions beyond the initial landing program. The will of Congress just was not there to fund those programs. So after Apollo 17, Skylab, and Apollo Soyuz, there were no more American programs using Apollo spacecraft and hardware. So you can see what the Soviet uh, hardware looked like. There's the uh, LOK orbiter that would have a single uh, astronaut that would remain in lunar orbit. The Apollo command service module that would have a single astronaut that would remain in lunar orbit. The LK lander would have a single cosmonaut that would get on land on the moon. And the much bigger Apollo lunar module would bring two astronauts down to the surface of the moon. Work on the L3 program continued with proposals for a dual launch shown as uh, steps one and two in the picture below. The first launch would send a lander propulsion module into lunar orbit. It would be followed by a second launch of a lander craft and crew. Inside the, land, the living module would be a standard crew return capsule. So there's a, a crew return capsule inside that uh, orbital module. The two craft would dock in lunar orbit and then the propulsion system would take the whole assembly to the lunar surface. The lander propulsion system would make the final touchdown and landing. The crew would have provisions for much longer surface stays. In the completion of the uh, surface mission, the crew would use the lander propulsion system for a direct return to Earth. Just before atmospheric re-entry, you can see the crew would climb into the re-entry capsule and separate it from the uh, uh, launch vehicle. That's uh, step number 15 for a safe return to Earth. Work on the N1 uh, launch vehicle continued as well with proposals for new liquid oxygen, uh, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen upper stages for future lunar missions into the 1970s and 80s for extended lunar orbit and crew surface stays. For example, the L5 heavy uh, lunar self-propelled craft would house a crew of three or four cosmonauts for lunar surface research activity lasting months rather than just days like Apollo. Sergei Korolev died in 1966. His assistant, Vasily Mission, took over at that point to try to carry on the N1L3 lunar uh, program. After the death of one cosmonaut on Soyuz 1 in 1967 and three more on Soyuz 11 in 1971 and the complete failure of the uh, Soyuz, the Soviet Zond and N1L3 manned lunar programs, Mission was dismissed in 1973. The Kremlin decided at that point to consolidate the entire Soviet manned space program under one, organized and headed by Valentin Gleshko. Gleshko hated the N-1 program and ordered that the two remaining launch vehicles associated with the program to be cut up and destroyed. If you travel to Baikonur today, you can see some of the pieces used as storage sheds or set out in a uh, park area. Nikolai Kuznetsov did not want his engines destroyed, so he secretly took all of them and placed them in storage. In the years since, they were sold for use on a number of Russian and American launch vehicles. Glushow ended up, uh, ended all work on the N1 booster and began work on a totally new launch vehicle called Energia, a space and a spacecraft to match the American space shuttle probe system. 
two launches of the Energia were made. The first one fit when the Polyus payload was pointed in the wrong direction at Earth uh, orbit insertion. The second and final flight carried a Soviet space shuttle called Buran. It flew two orbits unmanned and then landed back at Baikonur. It was then stored in the vehicle assembly building on top of a launch vehicle mock-up. On May 12, 2002, due to poor maintenance and a snow load and a possible earthquake, the building roof collapsed, destroying the Buran and its uh, transporter. You can see the picture in the upper right. Uh, the three high bays of the building are completely gone uh, as they uh, crash down below. The bottom set of pictures is uh, what's left of the uh, Veron space shuttle. You can, and the, on the far left, you can see the uh, spacecraft uh, windows uh, in all of the debris. Uh, the second picture uh, shows the fuel tanks of the uh, 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 launcher, uh, and you can match those with the picture directly above that. And the other pictures uh, show similar levels of destruction. Everything was just totally destroyed, and there was no point of uh, salvaging any of it. It was a disaster and a real disappointment. I got to Baikonur twice, and I got to see the Buran uh, two separate times before the uh, uh, spacecraft was destroyed in this building collapse. The Soviets developed two launch facilities for the N-1 booster. Each featured a turning, t uh, a, a bounding point, with three flame trenches for each of the turning, uh, for each, and a turning tower access gantry. After the lunar program was shut down, they were converted to support the space shuttle program. Today, they sit idle with the trenches filled with rainwater. In the United States, the government owns the various space program artifacts. In Russia, the individual corporations own the artifacts. So the Lovachkin Museum has a number of lunar program spacecraft, including models of the Luna 9 and 13 lander. The three actual lunar soil sample return capsules and the Lunacod 3 with its, L, uh, with its KT lander propulsion system that was never launched. The Zvezda Design Bureau that produced jet aircraft, pilot suits, and spacesuits for Soviet and Russian military and space programs. Their museum features suits from a number of programs, including the Vostok suit, the ejection seat, the Voskhod EVA suit, and the Lunar Cretchen suit. And there in the picture on the far lower right, uh, if you take a look, it looks like there's a face in the uh, viewport. That's me standing on the uh, uh, orange structure, support structure behind the, uh, leaning, leaning into the door and with my face in the window, so I'm not actually wearing the, uh, the Cretchen spacesuit. Korolev's OKB-1 Bureau is now the Energia Rocket and Space Corporation. Their museum has a number of space program artifacts, unlike the Smithsonian Air and Museum where things are behind plexiglass. In Russia, you can go right up and touch the various spacecraft and even climb into an actual Soyuz descent module. And the picture at the lower right is me inside the Soyuz uh, T-5 uh, descent module. The picture in the upper left is me standing next to Gagarin's uh, capsule, and you can see I can just reach right out and touch it. So uh, it's a very impressive museum with a lot of artifacts. Vasily Mission retired and became a member of the Moscow Aviation Institute. He brought along some of the lunar spacecraft hardware where it is on display today, and these include an R-7 launch vehicle. The second picture on the top row shows uh, the R-7 with its uh, conical strap-on uh, side boosters. It has an L-1 Zon descent module, a full-scale LK lamp lunar lander, and uh, you can see me standing next to it there on the, uh, uh, the third picture on the top. Uh, it has the orbital module that has been cut in half for better visibility and a 7K LOK propulsion system and tanks. So all of these things are cut apart to be able to show the engineering students uh, how these things are constructed.
so it's an educational institute as well as a museum. The Soviet lunar program uh, sat idle since Luna 24 in 1976. Recently, there's been announcements that Russia will return to the moon with a series of five spacecraft missions. These have been delayed, but the first one is progressing with a planned launch this year. You can see the various uh, spacecraft and uh, their intended missions. The Soviets launched the first satellite into Earth orbit, started what became the space race. This was just one element of the Cold War rivalry between the West and communism. The end of the Soviet Union in 1989 has brought a new era of hope and cooperation, with the biggest example being the International Space Station. There is still conflict today, but people working on big international pro projects like this can help promote better communication, understanding, and lead to a more peaceful world. Several nations are planning return to the moon. Most of these are too big for them to conduct these alone. So there will be an opportunity for future cooperation on these joint programs. So that ends the presentation. I want to thank you for those of you that are sitting by. And I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you, David. And what a great message to uh, end on there. Uh, I have some, if you want to stay seated, you can, because okay. there are a couple of questions okay. um, now that I think about it. Um, so one uh, from David Carter asks, uh, are all the photos in the presenta presentation taken by you? Uh, some of the photographs at the museum mm -hmm. were taken by me. I've been to Baikonur, uh, uh, let's see how many times, uh, three times, and uh, pictures of the scrap of the N1 launch vehicle. Uh, I, I took those, and several of the pictures in the various museums, I took those as well. Okay, yeah, I think that's why, because he, he mentioned that, or asked that question uh, when you like you were standing next to the landing uh, yep. system and, and such. Um, so, oh, okay, very good. Uh, one, uh, maybe maybe more of a rhetorical question, but uh, maybe still valuable in pointing out, uh, Bren, Brenda Richardson, asked, uh, they didn't care much about their cosmonaut safety, did they? I, I won't say that's true. Mm -hmm. No, they, they cared about them, but <clears throat> with the launch vehicles, the philosophy was to launch it, see what problems developed, and then fix those, and then launch another one and fix those. Mm -hmm. Our philosophy was to test the heck out of everything so that when we finally did launch something, it was rare that there was a problem. But to say that the cosmonauts, uh, you know, were not uh, uh, cared for, that's just absolutely not the case. Yeah, I think, I think it, it's just the nature of, yeah. of space travel. Exactly, there's hazards. Okay. Um, let's see what, I thought I saw one earlier too. Oh, that was a question about the can. Um, oh, and just one, again, maybe slightly more rhetorical, but just pointing out only, only one man in the, uh, the uh, lander. That's correct, because there was a weight problem. <clears throat> they made some initial back of the envelope calculations, and it seemed like they could send two uh, cosmonauts to the moon. But when they finally did all of the careful calculations, it was oops, you know. Yeah, uh, it, it showed that there just wasn't the lift capability to send a two man craft to the surface of the moon. It's a fascinating thought. Um, just being the solitary astronaut, like compared to the Apollo missions where you got a buddy, yes. and I guess it's flipped where there's one orbiting around. Yes. Uh, that, that's a fascinating thought if they actually were yes. able to make it there. In um, fact, with the, the surface cosmonaut, they had a special hula hoop that he would have around his waist in case he f fell over, he could use that hula hoop oh, okay. to kind of roll around to be able to get it back, oh, that, up, back upright. I did not know about that at all. That's, yeah. that's fascinating. Yes. Um, I think that's, if anyone else has any other questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll refresh the page here just to make sure that's not the problem I'm running into. Uh, there we go. Um, I, I, I have one question pop to mind. Maybe, maybe I just missed it in the, the presentation, but, um, uh, and pardon the, the, sci the rocket science pun, I guess, but wh where'd their momentum go? Um, when in, in this process, it seemed like they were, like you said in your presentation, they had a lot of firsts, and then all of a sudden it seems like it just dropped off. Yes. 
what it was is <clears throat> they, we had uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen for the Saturn V upper stages, second and third stages, and that made a tremendous difference in terms of lifting power and what we could put into orbit, mm, okay. whereas the uh, Soviets relied on liquid oxygen and uh, uh, kerosene as a propellant for the uh, N1L3, and uh, it, it just didn't have the, uh, uh, what you call specific impulse, the uh, miles per gallon type of gotcha. uh, rating. All right. So it was just mainly just a fuel, like the fuel technology. Fuel was a, it was a factor, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like that, that covers the questions for tonight. So I'll pop on the, the camera there to close out the show. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, let's see. Go back to camera view. There we are. Uh, so thank you all for tuning in. I want to thank David for uh, uh, volunteering his time tonight. Um, and also thank Broom uh, Pediatrics for sponsoring uh, tonight's program, as well as all of our uh, prior and future live streams here uh, that we have coming up. Uh, I guess one, one note that popped in mind during this, this show is if anyone's interested in watching uh, a show uh, sort of in line with tonight, today's theme, it's, it's more of a drama series, um, and it is rated TVMA, so not for families, but um, if any adults are out there and want to check it out, it's called For All Mankind, and it's a What If series. Um, that asks the question, what if the uh, Soviets were the first to land on the moon? Uh, what if it played out that way, and how would that ha have affected our the future of space exploration? And I, I watched the first season so far. It's been it's been pretty interesting. Um, so if that's something that interests you. I would, I'd recommend going to check that one out. Um, closing out the show here, you know. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, hit the subscribe button and that'll keep you up to date on the uh, latest live streams. Uh, we hope to get our big, uh, we're finalizing a few more live streams coming up here. So we'll post those links um, uh, on our upcoming streams tab on our channel so you can see those there. Or you can always go to our website, copernic.org, to, to see those updates too. And they um, can see back previous programs as well. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, we They can see, uh, so you can also go both to the website or our channel, and you can view all of our previous content. We don't get rid of it. Um, so any of our prior live streams from observing to presentations, those are all, all there for you to continue uh, to check out. Um, actually, on, on that note, if you go to, I'm trying to keep up on this, um, if you go to last week's observing stream, you can actually skip through that six hours of video to parts that might interest you. So if you're more interested in seeing the Whirlpool galaxy that we saw, there's a chapter section in there that says this is the Whirlpool galaxy imaging, or this is the star cluster uh, imaging. So you, you can skip to sections. It's very well laid out. Uh, YouTube has a great system in place for that sort of separating it into scenes, and that way you can skip any intermission periods and you don't have to watch all six hours. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to keep up with doing that um, on, on videos where it makes sense to add some specific chapters, especially our, our uh, long, long content. So uh, with that said, I should check the chat one more time. Pardon me, I'll bring my phone up here. See if there's anything else that I missed. Uh, here we go. Uh, we did that. Uh, Brenda asks, what channel is that show on? Oh, um, so it is, you do have to have, a, I think it's Apple TV Plus. It's an exclusive series to that. Um, however, I think there is a free trial, like most of those streaming services. So I, I watched mine on a free trial. Um, so... I'm not even sure what the price is, just because that's how I, how I consumed it. There's a, the second season is is going now, so it, it's, I think it sh premieres every Friday or something like that. Um, but the first season is there to go through um, if you if you like. Uh, all right. Well, that was the last comment I saw on there, so I think I will close out tonight's program. Thank you all for joining us, and we will see you again next time. <laughs>